We have CERN basher here only moments after the Fed's surprise, shocking decision to drop rates by a quarter percent. CERN, were you shocked and surprised? Absolutely floored, Randy. I was shocked. I thought they would raise rates by a full point today. <laughs> so with no surprise, the market seems to be flat about it. And the other, you know, very surprising thing is that Tesla is having trouble getting over 300. It's, uh, it, I think it's entirely possible during our conversation that we reach that. So we should keep one eye on that and see how it goes. See what, see if it happens during this conversation. That would it be could. Pretty With exciting. the information that I'm about to impart, I think it's highly likely. That could be the, it could be the whole thing. Yeah. Even though no one's actually watching it until after the fact, but. Right. Right. Sucks. But, you know, this is. This is recorded live or something. Isn't that how they describe what we do? Lively recorded, I think. Lively recorded. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll turn over the show to you then. I understand you're going to uh, be controversial today. Yeah, you might regret turning the show over to me today, Randy. Okay. But first of all, let's start with something that that you know that I love dearly, and that's uh, Cybertrucks. Yes. And this is an image from somewhere in Canada. Uh-huh. Not mine this time. I, I'm not coming to you with uh, with my own images in this case. Yes, but you know, just seeing cyber trucks in a parking lot like this, I think, is quite quite nice. Yeah, that's good. It's very crazy. Almost reminds you of a school of fish. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And it turns out that that humans aren't the only ones that love cyber trucks. No, oh. uh, we've captured this conversation between a couple of dogs here. <laughs> what do you dream of? Driving a Cybertruck, says the other dog. I meant your hopes and aspirations, says the first dog. And the other dog says, I know. <laughs> yes. Well, there you now, go. Now, with, with actually smart summon, we, we have seen dogs drive Teslas. Yes. It's just not in the Cybertruck yet. Right. But it'll be That's a no-brainer when, when we have full-on unsupervised. That's right. Yeah, that's going to be fun. Speaking of fun, Randy, the last time that you and I got together was, I believe, Halloween. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And since then, I went out and uh, committed to mayhem. <laughs> My costume was Felonius Gru. I see. I can see He's, that. He's uh, the supervillain, or one of the supervillains. Um, it was a little difficult driving the truck, though, I must say, with this mask on. Okay. But I live in Florida, and the police didn't seem concerned when they saw me driving the vehicles dressed like this. Yeah, just kind of a normal one of the citizens there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this was a, a family affair. Okay. <laughs> uh, my wife went as Lucy Wilde, who is uh -huh. Felonius Gru's wife. Yes. Uh, my daughter there is a minion. <laughs> and my son went as a bad guy. A bad guy. Okay. A bad guy. A bad guy. And he's not showing it there, but he had, he had a bag of money that he was carrying around <laughs> that, that seemed to got swapped out for a bag of candy at some point during the night. That's good. That's good. Yeah. 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 I think he was happy with his trade. So, yeah. Anyway, that was fun. Um, and, sure. you know, going out Halloween night in the cyber truck is uh, an added fun dimension for sure. I'm sure that this, you know, created a, 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 a new level of confusion out amongst the little giddies. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yep. All right. Well, speaking of supervillains, you know we have we have a uh, trunk or treat here in California. You yes, probably in Florida too. I suppose that's exactly that, what we did. I, I suppose now we could have frunk or treat. We could. Yes. We could now. Yeah. Yeah. We could do both. Right. Yep. All right. I was just going to transition this, and I, I've I've uh, I've failed in my my timing here. But speaking of super, super villains, Randy. Oh, speaking of super villains. <laughs> let's talk about Gary Black's uh, Tesla model. Just kidding. Gary I'm having Black's... some fun there. I actually like Gary a lot. Um, he came out on October 28th, I believe, with this update to his model. Yes. Uh, increase in his price target uh, over the next 12 to. Six to twelve months to three hundred from two seventy. Uh huh. Um, and so you know what I often do is I see posts like this and I and I think about them and I I build models for them. And that's what I did for Gary's model. And I, I just want to share some of, some of my thoughts around this. I also wrote a post about this where I might have been a little bit overly critical of Gary, 
Um, but I was really trying to be just critical of some of the approaches he took in his model. Right, right. Not so him personally. To do with Gary personally, right? No. And Gary's Gary's been on my show several times, and yep. Uh, and I have not been blocked yet because I have. I'm not sure I've ever said anything unkind. Well, I, I'm blocked, and I'm not really sure what I said that that bothered him so much. But yes, I'm in the in the block club. Yeah, that's fine. Yes. yes. Anyway, here is a, a screenshot of the part of the model that he shared. Okay. Now, I have no doubt that there's more detail behind this, um, but this is, was enough for me to take and essentially duplicate his model in a, in a spreadsheet of, of, of my own. Okay. Okay. So rather than going through this, this spreadsheet, I'll, I'll show you what, what I put together. Um, one of the things that, that jumped out to me was his assumption for gross profit of the auto division versus energy. Oh, and Gary's model, he modeled things out to the year 2030. Mm -hmm. And just looking at this, this seems a little bit conservative to me for energy expectations. Right. Absolutely. He's got energy growing pretty, pretty nicely, but still, it's still a pretty small part of the business in 2030. Right. Um, so that was the first observation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he's, he's largely treating it as an auto company, even, even 2030. So if I was to if I was to guess, it looks to me like he's maybe thinking energy is growing around thirty percent a year. I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, which which is a healthy number. Yes. Um, although I think that Elon's expectations for energy growth is is probably higher than that. Right. Uh, he has said that he feels that energy will be as big as the auto division at some point. Now maybe it's not twenty thirty, but even so. I would expect by then it's probably contributing more profit than what is showing here. He also, just based on this one, he he has very little growth for 2025 on auto. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's all right. right. All right. Well, I, I don't want to get ahead of you. No, that's all good. And so here's here's the first part of my post. And maybe, uh, you know, I if I did it again, I might, might use some different words. But I was a little critical about how he sort of determined the, the longer term future value of, of Tesla. And I would like to kind of go through that today. Sure. Um, his price increase was largely driven by the fact that he increased his 2030 earnings per share estimate from 15 to $16. Mm, okay. And from there, he bases the future value of the company by growing the $16 on out into the future. I see. Um, I haven't seen any, any numbers from him in terms of, you know, Tesla's actual revenue revenues, you know, after 2030. Now, you do get to a point in the future where it's where it's almost impossible to ha have any kind of reasonable expectation for what revenues and profits will be. Sure. But 2030 is kind of just around the corner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, here are his earnings expectations for the next six years. Okay. Okay, so 360 in 2025 on out to $16 by 2030. Okay, so that's that's a pretty nice, pretty nice chart. Right. Right. And by the way, now, just just uh, for fun, my number for 2025 is about 415, not counting robotaxis, which with robotaxis, I'm trying to be conservative. I have it about 435. Mm -hmm. So I'm not that far off from his number, but a, a, a little bit. Yeah. Yep. And I believe his numbers are materially higher than Wall Street. Right. Yes. Sir. I'm not mistaken. I think I think Wall Street right now might be just under three dollars. Yeah. So when we think about valuation, it's not just the earnings next year that matters. Sure. It's not just the earnings over the next five or six years that matters. It's the earnings over the lifetime of the company. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, it's very difficult to figure out what the earnings of Tesla is going to be in 2050 and what the world even looks like then. Right. Right. So you do have to make some assumptions and, and take a few shortcuts here and there. But when you when you look at this on a chart, it looks a bit like this. So the previous uh, columns that we saw on the previous chart are shown here on the right. Okay. 2025 earnings on the bottom and going up. Okay. And you can see they get bigger over these, these six years. Mm -hmm. But when you do a valuation model, the terminal value of the company, and what that means, it's the earnings from 2030 into the future. Right. Dominates the analysis. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. And the way Gary calculated his $600 terminal value 
in uh, in 2030 was taking the 2030 earnings of $16 a share mm -hmm. and multiplying it by a PE of 37.5. Okay. Okay. And he has a methodology for coming up with his PE. Uh, it's based on the beta of Tesla, and he had the beta at 1.7. Okay. And then he has a long-term growth rate of 25%. Okay. Okay. And so on. So he calculates his, his PE ratio based on that, mm -hmm. and he gets his terminal value. Right. Fine. And we'll, we'll discuss some of the nuances of that in just a second. But this is um, not the present value of those earnings. This is the, the terminal value you know, in 2030. If we discount it back to today, we get a present value of $270 for those earnings post-2030. And okay. the present value of the earnings up until then is about $30 a share. So a total present value of about $300 a share. Okay. Okay. Um, and so that's fine. But, you know, when you look at this visually, you see that the terminal value is basically everything. Right. Right. It, it is the key driver of, of the model. Right. Okay. All right. So here, here are my criticisms. So I say that his valuation method uses a shortcut, right? He's using a PE metric of 37 and a half. Mm-hmm. And he's basing then the future value, the terminal value of Tesla's earnings post 2030 on the 2030 earn earnings of $16 times that 37 and a half. Right. Now, why 37 and a half? Now, he has his methodology for that. Right. But is the growth rate for Tesla into perpetuity 25%? Is that a reasonable number? Mm -hmm. It might be over the very, very long run. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But between now and 2030, or even post 2030, it's highly likely, in my opinion, with RoboTaxi and Optimus, that we see growth rates way higher than that. Sure. Right. It could even be 100 or 200 percent for a period of time. Now, it might be a short period of time. No company can grow at that kind of rapid pace for very long. Not that size company. Usually. <laughs> usually. It's, yeah. It's, Robots it could change. You know, it could be different. Yeah, we'll see. So this modeling is very sensitive to the PE ratio that you assume. Right. If you use the PE ratio of 50 or even, you know, 60 or 70, you get a very different number. Right. Okay. Or, or if you were to think that maybe even one or two years would be at a higher rate, especially if they were 31, 2031 and 2032, all of a sudden it skews everything yeah. if, if it settles back to 25% after that. That's right. And ideally, you kind of want to model those years separately and then use that growth rate into perpetuity, you know, in the later years. Here's my biggest beef with, with okay. his model. Okay. Is that the 2030 earnings per share number is largely based on autos and deliveries of autos and some contribution of energy. If you think right. about the first chart I showed, the energy contribution is still pretty small in 2030. Right. And my beef is that he doesn't consider, he doesn't model out explicitly the revenue and earnings contributions from RoboTaxi or Optimus. Right. This would be my biggest consideration concern also. I know there's been quite a bit of back and forth on X about that over the last few days and even this morning. Now, again, I might be getting ahead of you, but even this morning he responded again saying, look, Elon's been promising FSD uh, unsupervised for, you know, 10 years um, or eight years or whatever. And uh, he says, when I see it, I'll change my numbers. And that's fine. And that makes his modeling extremely conservative. Right. Because as it stands today, when you have a business opportunity where there's no revenue yet, effectively, it's a call option. Right. Right. There's potential for revenue. They're, they're building something. FSD is getting better and better. Many people can see the opportunity for autonomy. Right. Some people refuse to see it or refuse to accept it until it's reality. That's mm -hmm. fine. They're just being conservative. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you've got Waymo with a $25 billion market cap. Right. You know, in the, in, you know, in the private market. Um, so some people are ascribing a lot of value to autonomy. And, and with Waymo, you might be saying, okay, I have a physical product doing a physical job that it's designed to do, but I have a 
ab an absolute loss on current revenues. And it, some people would say that they can't see a future where there is a profit. And certainly um, other ride hailing services have found it very difficult to get the profit. Um, yep. And so you're still betting, if you're betting in this case, you're still betting on, you're still an option. Yeah, and you raise a good point because a lot of people say, well, Waymo has a $45 billion market cap because they actually have revenue. They're actually producing, a, you know, selling a service. They're actually giving rides to people. Right. Revenue, as you pointed out, is very different than profit. They're actually losing a lot of money, right. right? So sometimes it's actually better to run without revenue because it's cheaper. Yes, yes. Right, you lose less by not right. offering as a service before it's ready, right? And so having revenue or not, in my opinion, doesn't doesn't diminish the future value of that business. Mm -hmm. it's, it's true that the business is not really ready yet. Mm-hmm. To produce revenue now tesla is producing revenue from fsd so they're getting revenue that way right so it's not they're not really revenue free at this point now they're not getting fsd revenue based on rides given to people right, right. but they are earning some revenue from from this enterprise yeah and i've started a lot of companies as people know that watch the channel and i've also not only started lots of companies but i've helped a lot of other people either start or run companies like over 400 um, and then watched and valued, you know, hundreds more. And, and in analyzing something that is not yet producing a product or not yet producing revenue, not yet producing profits, I try to take into consideration the, 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 the total potential for the company based on the, the risk of it ever being able to produce a product or yeah. service the risk of it being able to produce revenues and the risk of it being able to produce profit. So it isn't any one of those three things. It's all three combined that I'm always looking at. And I, and I, I can tell you I've, I've launched or helped launch hundreds of products. And so over time you start to see what you think is got a real chance of success. You're not always right. <laughs> right. And that can be for a lot of reasons. It could be because of management. It could be, be because the company doesn't have enough money. It could be because the company decided that they couldn't afford advertising. I mean, I can tell you a list of reasons why good products that might have had a chance sometimes fail. Uh, and other times when it's fluky and the product goes crazy, even though everything was done incorrectly. So in this particular case, in the case of Robotaxi, I think it would be ridiculous to not give it value. Uh, there's way too many people in the game, way too many people that have looked at Tesla's model uh, and their concept and their approach and believe that it's it's only a matter of time. Yeah, my my view on it is that Robotaxi and Optimus both have a non-zero probability of being, in my opinion, materially large businesses. Right. So even if you want to build a model and then assign a low probability to that model, fine. But go through that exercise. Actually do that work and see what you come up with. Right. Don't, don't just wave your hand and say, it's not going to happen or there's no revenue. Elon's taken all these years. It's, it hasn't happened. Therefore, it's not going to happen. Right. In fact, maybe they've taken all this time to build something that's going to be incredibly, right. you know, incredibly important to the company. Exactly. Right, it's not like they've just been wasting these this this period of time, whatever period of time it is. Mm -hmm. Now, Gary does say that you know adding robo taxi revenues to his 2025 valuation seems premature. Fine, I agree with that, no problem. But from what I can tell, he doesn't consider it even in his 2030 number. Right. So, so where does that premature time period begin and end? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, end, I guess is the. There, there, there's another thing too which I find unusual in a lot of the valuations of the of Wall Street. Yes, there is an Elon Musk valuation. There's a there's a there's a an optionality to Elon Musk's brain. Mm -hmm. But let's say Robotaxi and Optimus never came to market. Well, I'm guessing that maybe that would free up time for Elon to start doing VTOLs or start doing um uh, opti, opti, opti valve based uh, HVAC systems are houses that are completely built around 
first principles. I mean, he's got so many ideas and so many directions that he could take that that optionality even should, I think, be part of the equation. Absolutely. In my opinion, that would be lesser, but yes, that's part of it. Um, and that relates to his track record and his ability to execute and so on. Right. That despite right. what people say that Elon's late and doesn't deliver, right. well, that's really, you know, he, he has delivered. It just takes time to deliver things that have never been created before. Right. right. Um, in terms of Optimus, you know, absolutely. Like the robots aren't there today, but you know what? They can already do useful work. Yes. And it's just this question of iteration and the speed of that iteration, how long it takes. That's that's the only question, in my opinion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not whether the robots will be useful or even have a, a business around that one day. They they will. Yes, yes. Um, it's more of a question of, of timing of that and, and the scalability and so on. Um, so... So that's that. The the other thing that, that Gary uh, took a little bit personally, I think, in my critique of him when I said he pulls numbers out of thin air, and maybe this is a bit too harsh, <laughs> but he doesn't share with us how he came up with the 25% growth beyond 2030. And without that, I'm kind of just led to believe that he's just kind of pulling a number out of out of the air, right? There's no There's no backup in terms of how he arrived at that, right? He's not saying, oh, I'm assuming that that the auto business, you know, slows down to zero growth and I'm getting 25% growth from RoboTaxi and Optimus. He, he doesn't make that kind of statement. Sure. Right. So I'm, I'm left wondering where, where does that come from? It seems like a, just kind of an odd number to pick. Right. 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 It's, it's a pretty high number to assume a company is going to go at 25% into perpetuity. Right. Yeah. Right. You better have a good reason for that because there's not many companies that, that you would say that about them. Or, or, vi or vice versa, given the history of Tesla, given his, given Elon's history, it might be a low number. And why would it be so low when you do know that there is a, there are already stated products that Elon says that he would like to do someday. Yeah, I haven't even talked about all of them. Boats, uh, container ships. I mean, there's lots of places where this company could go based on Elon's stated uh products that that's right makes sense i mean they even yeah. make sense yeah just transitioning the world to sustainable energy is a big a right. big opportunity for many decades right yeah and, and maybe that's where he's getting the 25 percent growth from I, I don't know he, he he doesn't share that with us right so maybe my choice of words was bad here and accusing him of pulling out of thin air it's a little bit harsh right. um i'm sure he has his reasons for the number he just didn't share them Okay. All right. Okay. A more technical criticism, and this is a minor one. You know, he assumes, he assumes a PE to growth ratio of 1.5 and a beta of 1.7. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that betas are not stationary. As companies mature and become larger, the volatility of a stock can go down materially. Sure. All right. Look at the volatility of Apple over the last 10 years. It's come down a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would expect the same thing to happen with Tesla. Why does this matter? Because it helps determine sort of the discount rate that you use to discount the earnings. Right. If the volatility is high, you use a higher discount rate and so on. So if, if a company is less risky, less volatile, you use a lower discount rate, which means that the present value is higher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So those are, those are minor nits, not a big deal. And then I graphed out you know, the value of the company sort of year by year into the different buckets. And so 2025 earnings accounts for 1% of Tesla's current present value mm. as Gary, as Gary modeled them here. Mm. Okay. 2026 accounts for 1.3% of the company's value. Wow. Right. So the next six years of earnings account for just a little bit more than 10% of Tesla's value today. Wow. The present value. You know, and the terminal value or the, the value of Tesla after 2030 accounts for almost 90% of the, the current present value of the company as calculated by Gary. Right. And so, again, back to my critique of where did your numbers come from for post-2030? If 90% if of the company company's valuation is based on 2030 or beyond 2030, Share more information about how you came up with your numbers that you're using to calculate that. Sure. So, right. 
So you might have to educate me here. I, I have never spent much time thinking about terminal value since I'm usually dealing with companies that are, uh, uh, you would be thrilled if they're just in business seven years from now uh, because they're small businesses, they're mom and pop businesses and you know much harder to, to judge whether they will be in business seven years. So terminal value has never been much of my uh, method of calculating a company's value. I'm usually looking three to five years out, depending on the kind of business. And it's some multiple of sales or some multiple of profits uh, discounted discounted back to current value. Or in some cases, it might have to be the, the enterprise value right now based on uh, what you could sell the, the bits for uh, if you had to do a fire sale. So there's a bunch of different ways to get there, but what would be a reasonable percentage of a major corporation like this to think in terms of the terminal value? It's got to be more than five or seven or 10% because in fact, when you're paying a multiple of 30 or 50 or 60, you are expecting this company to be in business 25 years from now. So is right. there a, is there a formula that would make more sense? Well, it's entirely dependent on two things. One is the the number of years in the front before you calculate the terminal value. In this case, we're using six years. Right. For a lot of models, you might use 10 years, maybe 15. Okay. And so that 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 by its very nature then pushes more of the right. value in the first 10, 15 years and the terminal value as a percent becomes smaller because you're looking at more out years. Right. Or years that are further out, sorry, I should say. Okay. Another big impact is your growth assumption post those years that you're modeling, in this case, post 2030, what's the growth assumption for, for Tesla's earnings? Mm -hmm. Gary had 25%. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the earnings of the company is going to come from 2031 and beyond. I see. Okay. Right. And so even discounted back to the present, that's still a large percentage of the current value of the company. Got it. So if this is also partly the reason that, you know, when analysts get overly exercised about one bad quarter, mm -hmm. it's kind of like that's only a quarter of 1% of right. the company's present value. Right, right, right. Now, and so if, if Gary had posited a higher growth rate, let's say from 25 to 30, if he was saying 50% a year growth rate in those years, and then a drop down to 20% in the, in the terminal years, that yeah. then would give a much uh, smaller percentage to the terminal years. It would. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And so this is just kind of mathematical reality of, of right. modeling high growth out for, for a long period of time. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And, and it's also brings to realization that the challenges of modeling and coming sure. up with the present value or a price target for a stock because most of the future value discounted to the present right. is way in the future. Right. Right. And this is why we see probably a lot of volatility with stocks because people get, you know, excited or disappointed in the short term and making small changes to their assumptions can yield a big change in the present value. Right. right. Even though in all likelihood, it's going to be some point in the future when that really plays out. But we live, in the here and now. And so part of it is, well, okay, what am I going to pay for this company today that may deliver something to me in five, 10, 15 years? Exactly. There's a lot of uncertainty around that. Okay. Yep. Uh, this is also why I think a lot of Wall Street kind of chases their tails with, with company earnings because they, they're not really thinking about projections all that deeply, in, in my yep. opinion. And, and in fact, I know personally, if I were... When I model, I might model three to five years on a company like Tesla. I don't model beyond that because I think it becomes insane to to, to think that we have a clue. Um, but if I even yeah. three to five years is difficult. Um, but if you take that three to five years, I never I never put this terminal valuation in there. And I'm guessing that many, many people like myself that are slightly more amateurish probably don't take the terminal uh valuation into account at all. They're really looking at what's that company looking like in three years. Now I'll do my present value from that. Yeah. And, and for a lot of companies, you know, you've got to get past the first three years before you can even look into the future, right? Like a lot of those companies are in dire straits that you, if you, if you just survive the next three years, you're doing well. 
<laughs> right, exactly. You're not even, you haven't even, the startups, you haven't even posited a profit plan for the, for that three-year period. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Anyway, we, we can dive into the kind of the math behind this. It's maybe in another show, I can share with you some other hypotheticals and show you, you know, what percent the terminal value is at different growth rates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If your terminal, if you're growing in terminal value, let's say at three or something like inflation, an average of inflation percent, let's say 3% a year, right. your terminal value as a percent of your valuation is going to be a lot smaller. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, here's how I worded my criticism around all that. Um, you know, he's, he's valuing the company really, in my opinion, just as an auto company, most of the valuation is based on autos and auto deliveries. Okay. And his, he's saying that the, you know, he states that Tesla is no longer viewed as a car company by most investors. A company's PE is based on its future expected growth rate, not the business in which it competes. Right. And he confidently states once Tesla's auto profit mix falls below 50%, it will no longer be compared to other car companies. Hmm. I think it'll happen way sooner than that, but that's fine. Yes. yes. It already, right? it's already more... happening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's already happening. But then I, then he, you know, I say Gary bases his earnings projections largely on auto deliveries, right? Even though he's saying it's not a car company. Right. Um, so anyway, um, just, you know, that's his approach. It's a good approach. It, ser it serves him well. Uh, you um, know, some, something else just popped into my mind. If Elon had made a decision that, for instance, let's say that he decided five years ago that, F that FSD was gonna, always going to be just an ADA and it was never going to be fully autonomous. And so forget the robot taxi business. He would have strategically changed his approach to the sale of the vehicles. His, yeah. his statement that he would be willing to sell them with no margin at all would go away. His, his new approach would be to maximize margins based on any given market situation um, and you know build, build brand ID, et cetera, kind of like all automobile companies do. And so that would have changed everything uh, in terms of how he managed the business during this difficult uh, slot, uh, potentially reducing production in order to maximize margins, et cetera. You know, all kind, maybe uh, maybe even advertising. He may have even, even come to the conclusion that he was going to need advertising if he wasn't going to be able to depend on some future uh, um, uh, uh, robo taxi business. Randy, I think that actually is an incredibly insightful comment. Thank you very much. That if why. if if Elon didn't believe, or your the whole comment there, if Elon didn't believe that that he was going to get to Robotaxi via FSD, his approach would have been entirely different. And I think this shows us the confidence that he has. Right. Now again, maybe it takes longer than he expects. Fine. In in the end, we're not going to care. Right. <laughs> exactly. Right. If it's two or five years delayed, it's in the whole scheme of things that is not going to matter. Right. Right. Does it, any, anybody remember that the IBM mainframe was delayed by five years? Right. <laughs> who, who cares today? Like it's not even relevant. Right. Now I just made that up. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> um, and I'm just going along and nodding my head. <laughs> yeah. 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 Just, just to be clear, but I'm sure that there are new products that have been introduced into the world that didn't arrive on time. Right. This is not the first time that this has happened. Exactly. And, and maybe it's because this is a challenging problem. Absolutely. Sure. But it doesn't mean that the problem won't be solved. Right. Yeah. Anyway, so not to not to harp on this too much. I think we've covered my criticisms regarding his valuation approach. I'm I'm glad that he puts his model out there. Uh-huh. It does open it up to some criticism. I want my criticism to be perceived constructively. I'm not attacking him as a person. Right. Um, and I'm not suggesting that valuing Tesla is easy. In fact, it's a lot of hard work to properly value Tesla. Right. Right. Really to do it in a really detailed way. It's very difficult. And of course, the more detailed you are, then the more opportunity there is to put bad inputs in the model. Absolutely. So sometimes it's actually nice to do shortcut versions. And I think the combination of a detailed model and very shortcut versions actually can serve investors very well to help them understand the valuation of a company. Yeah. Yeah, I do okay. too. Mm -hmm. um, here's an example for you. If if we assumed, um, I think in this one, I've got 30% growth versus Gary's 25 for the terminal okay. value. And you can see how much that changes things. Right. 
And I also lowered the risk number a little bit here as well in terms of the discount rate. Um, and so, yeah, the model is very sensitive to some of these assumptions right? with the way that he's, he's modeled it here. Okay. Uh -huh. um, this is Gary's comment. I think this was directed towards me, although he doesn't name me by name here. Um, he says, I feel it's bizarre. Some Tesla bulls feel the need to attack fellow Tesla bulls. Spend your time and energy attacking those dumb enough to short Tesla, not other Tesla longs. If this were a sports team, you'd be thrown off. <laughs> fair, fair criticism. If this was a sports team, maybe I would be kicked off. True. <laughs> but you know what? We're not playing sports here, Randy. No, it's a very different, a very different game. And by yeah. the way, he's you're not the only Tesla bull that's ever criticized him or even criticized him lately. Um, because I, I think it's very important. Gary's own defense of himself is that he is not taking the position of a Tesla bull. He's taking the position of a Wall Street analyst mm -hmm. and analyzing it the way that Wall Street analysts do. Not, not to say that he thinks it should be analyzed differently, but only rather than Randy Kirk doesn't is not handling other people's money. I am not, yeah. I'm not making any decisions about other people's money, just my wife's and my own. That's it. Right. So I can take a very bullish, a very optimistic look, make my bets based on that optimistic look. Um, and, and if I'm wrong, I'm only wrong for two people. Whereas the, the Wall Street analyst has got a, a, a much bigger group of folks that he is responsible to uh, uh, legally as well as, as, as ethically. Um, and so, a, a more conservative, a more um, a moderate approach makes sense. Having said that, I think there's a full range of of, of uh, folks on Wall Street, uh, many of which we are very familiar with, Dan Ives and others, um, who do show optionality um, yeah. in road taxi, optionality in uh, the insurance part of the business, optionality um, in the Optimus. So I don't think it's ir irresponsible to do that. Uh, just more conservative than Gary Blackway. Yep. No, and I respect that. And also there's folks like me. In my case, I'm a professional investment advisor. Right. And nothing I say here is to be construed as, as investment advice. Right. That's always a disclaimer. Right. But one of the reasons that I don't give price targets and don't publish, you know, financial models projecting the value of Tesla, you know, on a per share basis is 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 for that very reason i, I have professional standards to uphold mm -hmm. um also it's very difficult things can change you know i'm, I'm not I, i'm not desiring to be it's not my goal to be precisely right in the short term i'd like to be approximately right about something over the long term sure and so most of my analysis is focused on that long term you know beyond 2030 frankly is what i care more about right right and I hope I've shown here today sort of why, because most of the value of the company actually is going to accrue, you know, post that date. And so it's important to be looking out mm -hmm. and thinking about what Tesla will look like and what its businesses could be like at that point in time. Exactly. Right. So I, I'm not really in the game of coming up with, you know, near term price targets. I, I don't really know where Tesla's going to trade at, uh, even though right now we're knocking on the door of $300 a share today. That's that's great. But that's that's not my focus. Yeah, and so uh, to your point, um, we still have not crossed two ninety nine seventy four. So there, there we're still twenty six cents short of hitting the three hundred. So what are you going to do? Another day, Randy. Another day. <laughs> another day. <laughs> and speaking of another day, I understand you will be back tomorrow with another. Um, so I will, and just to preview it. So okay, if this first go. discussion wasn't. Uh, you know, enough controversy for you. Yes. We're going to step into another controversy that is non-politically related. Okay. Despite what you're seeing on the screen here with this cartoon. Yes. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> um, but I want to introduce an important topic, I think, for your listeners, viewers, to think about because there's a technology out there that I think most people have a mistaken understanding of because the narrative that they're getting about this technology has led them astray. Oh my goodness. 
And I'd like to try to set that straight or at least begin to. So that's that's the preview for the next show. All right. Well, you know, um, that would be um, very, very interesting, I think. I think it will be. Um, I would encourage people to approach it with an open mind. Okay. All right. Because I need to I need to break you down first before I can build you back up. There you go. That's that's a good a, a good a good thing to do. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for being willing to break us down. <laughs> Sounds so exciting, doesn't it, Randy? <laughs> All right, CERN. As always, thank you for coming on and regaling us with your uh, comedic slides and the ones that are you know serious as well. And uh, to all of you out there, it's been great talking to you.